my heart for today's message, ladies, for you to be seen, for you to be heard, for you to be uh, understood, but also I want to give you an opportunity today to be real and to be honest with yourself. Ladies, you carry around a whole bunch of stuff that you feel like you can't invite people into. Uh, you feel like maybe your husbands don't understand. Uh, you feel like maybe you know, your partner, your significant other won't get it. Uh, you don't even understand your feelings half the time. But I, I want you to walk out of here today and say, okay, I felt real things. And I got an idea of, of kind of some real options for myself. But I felt seen. I felt heard as a mom. I was acknowledged today. So that's, that's the hope for you today. And I also just want you to know that everything I talk about today, I, I read from another woman, from a mother. Uh, almost none of this comes from me. Very, very little comes from my heart uh, and, uh, uh, or comes from my mind or my wisdom because I'm not, I'm not a mom. And so what I did is I went and I found some moms and some great things that they were saying, and I put this message together for you today. So I just want to say that in a way to honor you guys that I'm not coming out here saying, well, here's all the answers you know, that I have, uh, because I don't. I don't have any of the answers um, at all. So, all right, so today's message is called The Jekyll and Hyde of Motherhood. So moms, this is a picture of you. This is what's going on inside your emotions. It's what's happening inside your thoughts and inside your heart. In fact, when I sent Casey this picture, this is one woman, but two sides of the same woman. Casey's response back to me was, how did you know exactly how I felt right now? And that's exactly it. Ladies, How you feel like you got it together, and then you feel like you don't have it together. So Jekyll and Hyde, uh, as I was kind of asking our staff and some other people, uh, I felt quite proud of myself over the title of this message, and no one else, turns out, cares, you know, so I was like, hey, uh, do you know who Dr. Jekyll is, and Mr. Hyde, look how clever, this, you know, it's, I feel like, oh, I actually came up with something smart, and everyone's like, no, we don't know who that is, so let me tell you who it is, yeah, I know, I know, it's tough being me, all right, 1886, uh, there was a story written called The Story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Jekyll, he is a, a well-respected man. And what he does is he becomes obsessed with the idea that there is good and bad in each of us. And so he creates a serum. And this serum, when he injects it in himself, it brings out of him what would become Mr. Edward Hyde. And Mr. Hyde was not bound by the same like moral obligations or social or cultural obligations like being nice or being kind or, or being proper. And he wasn't bound by any of that stuff. He was just the wild, pure embodiment of, of actually evil. It's about the evil that was in him. And Dr. Jekyll comes across this problem because the serum stops working which means Mr. Edward Hyde started coming out more and more and more and more, and he no longer could control it. And so Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it's, it's this story about how there's like two different opposing forces in each and every single one of us. There's a good and there's a bad. And sometimes the good is coming out more. Sometimes the bad is coming out more. I can prove this to you. It's okay, moms. I'm going to take a little bit of a kind of a jab at you, and I, I want to give... The, the children and the dads some advice here. All right, when, when I put the next thing on the screen here, I, I need you to be stoic. And in fact, I need you to shake your head and say, no, not my wife. No, 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 not my mom. So, okay, I'm just preparing you because we have some men that are hiding in the office back here because they laugh too loudly at this, all right? So this is how I can prove the Jekyll and Hyde in every single mother because there's nothing better than a mom's love, and there's nothing scarier than a mom's crazy, all right? There's nothing, I got, I got some yes and amens here. There's nothing scarier than a mom's crazy, all right? A mom's love, amazing, fantastic. It fills a, a void. It fills a hole just, you know, that is just unfillable in any other way. You know, our, our kids walk around the house, they're like, you know, I'll say, hey, good morning. I love you. It's good to see you. First thing out of our kids' mouths, mom. It reminds you know this. Where's mom? Where's mom? You know, when, when Benjamin was little, I would just, if Casey needed space or she needed to take a shower or she needed, you know, something like that, I would say, oh, mom's going dodos, you know, which was mom's in the bathroom. She's going number two. She wasn't, but that was just the thing that Benjamin would understand. He'd be like, oh, okay, well, I'll give her space to, to do that. So the crazy in a mom comes out, and it is crazy. 
As great as the love is, is how crazy the crazy can be. And I've heard it in my own wife. I'll hear, I'll be sitting somewhere in the house, and I'll hear a tone. Guys, you know the tone, the tone that changes. It's, it's, it's not just, uh, hey, Benjamin, don't do that. It becomes like a Benjamin, and then I know, I know, okay, things cra- crazy is coming out here, <clears throat> right? And some of you experienced that uh, this morning, and that's okay. And, you know, I just want to say, moms, you know, you guys do have superhero. You guys are superheroes. You guys do have superpowers. You really, I mean, you really do. And when you want your crazy moments, you've got, you're absolutely probably most likely entitled to every single one of them. But what this tells us, so here's what this says here. Because now I want to kind of start to get into some stuff that I, I want where I acknowledge you and hopefully we give you some things that can help you. So motherhood is a dichotomy. It's a struggle between two opposing forces. Because you have, you know, the Dr. Jekyll and the Mr. Hyde. It's easy. It's fun to be funny about that. It's fun to say that you've got this love and you've got this crazy. And, and those are two opposing forces in you. You know, love on one side, crazy on the other. But here's where we get a bit serious. There are some really serious, uh, some serious opposing forces in you. And these are things that kind of make you doubt your motherhood. They make you doubt yourself. They, they, they cause a lot of insecurity, um, a lot of shame. Uh, and, and again, everything I say today has come from mothers. These things cause just that you carry around a burden because of this. It, it's not just the funny uh, love and crazy, but this stuff is the stuff that really impacts your heart. It, like you carry this with you. And it makes you doubt, am I okay? Am I, am I good? Am I bad? Am I, am I a good mom? And so these opposing forces, well, I've picked three that I just want to recognize. I feel like you probably can identify with at least one of these. And so the, the first one is, I want to be a mother, but I didn't sign up for this. This is me recognizing those of you that said like, yeah, bring it on. I want motherhood. But then maybe the postpartum depression settles in. Or maybe later on, you say, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. This is hard. Or, wait a minute, I thought that I would connect more with my baby or love my baby more, but I, I don't. Or, I, I thought I would just have more patience, but I don't. Or, 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 you know, I don't like the sleepless nights. I don't like this. I don't like the fact that this highlights that we have no money or no opportunity. Like, I didn't quite sign up for this. That is an opposing force. I want to be a mother, but I didn't sign up for this motherhood that I'm experiencing now. And that brings a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of regret, even a lot of like hate and anger can come out of that. You know, another one is that I wish I was a mom, but now I wish I was at work. Because there's, yeah, some of that is like I, I just want away from the kids. And some of this has to do a lot with your identity. Of like, well, okay, I, I wanted to be a mom. I, I read a story. I won't tell you the whole story, but it was a story of a mom sharing how she would sit while she was at work and watch moms come into like a moms and babies uh, like gym class or whatever. And she just longed to do that with, with a child. And then she eventually conceived and had a child. And she found herself going to those same classes and then she was looking inside the coffee shop that she used to look out of. And she was saying, I wish I was in there getting work done or doing work. That's a real struggle that some of you have, that a lot of you probably have. And then this third one, this is the one that I feel like is probably like the, the heaviest because it probably applies to so many of us. And that's, I I'd felt that I had a purpose to fulfill as a mom. However, now I have lost my purpose because I am a mom. And this is the dangerous one. This is the danger zone. Because you felt like, okay, my purpose is to bring kids into this world and to, to, to be a mother. And now that you are that, you're saying, but, but I've lost now, I've lost my identity. I don't know who I am. All I am is either a taxi or a feeding machine or a cleanup machine or, you know, whatever it is that you feel like you're just doing on repeat over and over and over and over and over again in your home. And this purpose that you used to feel like you had has now become lost. And, and, and this, is, this is a danger place. 
Because this can bring you down into that depression or into that real sorrow or that real sadness. When we don't have purpose in our life, then we tend to waffle and we tend to wonder. Now, every single one of you does have purpose. The thing to highlight here is that this is a feeling. It's not a reality. This here is the way you feel, but it's not God's plan for you. It's not God's reality for you. Now, I want to show you how God can use your motherhood to help. If this is you, if there's been an opposing force that you've dealt with, I want to show you how God can use your motherhood to help you today. And I hope that this reveals a little bit about God's character. So did you know that God uses motherhood to show you how much you need him? So God will use the fact that you're a mom to show you how much you need God. Let me explain this to you through a couple examples here. I'll tell you about Hannah. Hannah is one of the most famous mothers in the Bible. In fact, our, your kids are doing a little bit on Hannah out there right now. Hannah was driven to God in pursuit of motherhood. So motherhood drove her to God because she was pursuing it. Here's the story of Hannah. Hannah, uh, a character, a real character, a real person from the Bible. So in Hannah's time, ladies, moms, you had one job, one very important job, produce children. And if you could not do that job, then you were shamed and you were kind of outcast and you were looked down upon. Hannah was married and her husband was a good guy. He really was a good man. He had two wives, Hannah being one of them. Now the other wife, she could have kids and she did have kids, but Hannah could not. Now it just so happened that her husband loved Hannah more than the other. He had, he had a special affection for her and he took good care of her. Now, every year, one of the traditions that they did as Jewish people is they would take a journey to the temple. And when they went, they would have to take meat and they would have to sacrifice for their sins. So it happened every year. And every year when they would go, Elkanah, the husband, would give the wife that could bear children their portion of the sacrifice. But then to Hannah, he would give ten times more. He really loved this woman. He cared for her. But when they were there at the temple... And they were on this journey. Hannah would be berated and made fun of and poked at by the other wife because she couldn't have kids. So imagine your deepest, most sort of strongest insecurity that you feel and that you have is being highlighted and thrown back at your face. And that's what Hannah is experiencing every single time they go to the temple to do this sacrifice. Finally, she can't handle it anymore. She stops eating. She's depressed. She has a long face. She's filled with sadness and sorrow. Even her husband says, what's wrong? And she tells him. And then he says, well, but, but don't I give you ten times more? And she's, you know, he's, he's basically saying, you know, I think as, as husbands, we can sort of miss it. You know, he couldn't see that she was dealing with her insecurity and the fact that, that he could not understand what it was like to have her greatest insecurity brought right in front of her eyes and pointed out to her that she would have to just own up to and deal with that she couldn't bear children. Greatest insecurity. And then her husband, meaning well, he comes along and he says, yeah, but don't I help you with this? Or don't I give you more with this? So that, that's, that's as good as his intentions were. That's not what she needed. But she tries to honor him and she does eat. And she does try and kind of have a, have a happier disposition. But it's, her heart's not been changed. So she finds herself, she leaves one on one of these trips. She gets by herself to pray. And she begins praying and talking to God. And it just so happens that while she's praying, talking to God, Eli, the priest, this is like the big dog of the temple, he's there and he hears her praying. Well, he doesn't hear her praying. He sees her lips moving but doesn't hear anything. And so he actually asked her, hey, are you, are you drunk? And she's like, no, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm, I'm praying. And she, she prays this prayer. Let me show you this prayer here. This prayer is, it's in 1 Samuel. And it says that she made a vow saying, this is her talking to God. She made a vow, a promise. Oh, Lord of hosts, if, I want you to pay attention to this word, if. If you will indeed look on the affliction, the suffering. So she's saying, look at me, God. I'm suffering here. Look at the suffering of your maidservant and remember. And not forget, don't forget me. Look at me. Remember me. Don't forget me. 
ladies, moms, it, it, she's saying, do you see me, God? Can you see me? Can you look at me? Can I matter to you? Can you remember me? Can you not look over me or look past me? And that, that's what she's, she's just crying out to God here. And she says, please don't forget your maidservant. But will you give your maidservant a son? May I have a son? Take care of my deepest insecurity. Solve my deepest problem. Bring, bring to me the thing that would create value in me. Bring to me that, that thing. Give me the value that I need here. And so then she, said, she asked God for this. And she says, Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. A razor shall never touch his head. She's made a big promise here. She has said, If you, God, give me a son, then I will turn him back over to you. I will give him back to you. That, that is a, that's a bold statement. That's a bold if-then. How many of you have made if-then statements where you've said, God, if you will just do this, then I, will, I, will, I promise you, God, I'll do this here. It, it, we've all been there where we've made these if-then statements, but this was a big one because she's asking for motherhood to be given a son, and then she's going to take the thing that makes her a mother and give it back to God. Which, when I read this, I just thought, well, this is kind of crazy here. Because if you want to be a mother, I would think that this prayer would go something along the lines of, God, give me a child, and then I'll remember you, and I'll raise him in your ways, in my home, never out of my sight, and he will never leave or marry, and no girl will ever be good enough for him. <laughs> right? That's how I would think that the prayer would go. But she, she's not, she doesn't have to give this child to God. But she says, God, if you give me this child... Then I will give him back to you. It's a big if-then statement. So it comes time where she has the child. She conceives and she has this baby. And then it comes time where it's time to go to the temple. And Elkanah, her husband, says, Hey, we're, we're headed to the temple. It's time for you to bring Samuel, who would become Israel's greatest prophet. Bring Samuel to the temple to give to the, to the priest. He says, Hey, don't you remember you made this deal with God? And she looks at him and says, not, not yet, not until he's weaned, which would be like three years old. And Samuel, like a good husband, realizes that the crazy has come out. And he says, sure, fine, do it on your own terms. And then he leaves, leaves her home. But that age would come around when the child was three and he was fully weaned off of mom. And she took him to the temple and she handed him over. She gave her child away. I want you to look at the difference in the prayer that she prays. See, she went from being depressed and unable to eat, filled with sorrow and shame and desperation, to now, after giving her son up, look at her, her view from God. She went from, God, please don't forget me and look over me, to now saying, Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices and triumphs in the Lord. My horn, my strength is lifted up in the Lord. My mouth has opened wide to speak boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Those insecurities are gone. Those struggles are gone. That pain is gone. There is no one holy like the Lord. She went from God, do you see me? To God, there is no one as holy as you. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. That's a changed woman. That's a changed mother. But it was her motherhood, her pursuit of motherhood, that brought her to God. And she still had to do a hard thing. But look at what happened when she came into the presence of God. Totally changed her. Now the second story of a mom that I want to tell you about is a Syrophoenician woman. It's a kind of a big word, but it, it represents where she was from. Now this woman, unlike Hannah, Hannah was a Jewish woman, so she kind of had access to the temple, had access to God. She understood prayer. She understood a lot about the God that she was praying to. But the Syrophoenician woman was a Gentile. She didn't know anything about God. She didn't know anything about prayer. She didn't know anything about making sacrifices. This woman was just off living her life, her godless life. And then there comes an opportunity for her to encounter Jesus. And she's driven to God, a God that she did not know, because of her motherhood. So let's look at her story here. I think this is such an interesting 
uh, story and so many layers. I could do a, a couple different messages on this one. So let me show it to you here. Let's read. And they're going to put that on the screens for you. Jesus got up and he left there, so left the place where he was. And, uh, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. It's a coastal area of Phoenicia. Now, this is significant because Jesus will read in here. He came primarily for the Jews and for the Israelites, not for the Gentiles. Paul did a lot of work for the, the Gentiles, for taking the gospel message to the Gentiles. But Jesus makes a trip here where he goes 80 kilometers out of his way to go to this region, 80 kilometers to go and reach the Gentiles. See, we can't say that Jesus ignored them or he didn't care about them. No, he cared very deeply. The whole point of him dying on the cross was to bring everyone into the presence of God. Gentile, Jew, everybody could now come into the presence of God. But Jesus goes 80 kilometers out of his way to this region here. And when he does, he enters a house and he didn't want anyone to know that he was there. But it was impossible for him to be hidden from the public. So Jesus, he's just trying not to like, hey, the healer's here. Hey, God in flesh is here. Because he knows that the Gentiles don't have a reference for that. And he knows that the time where he is pronounced the Savior for the Gentiles has not yet come. So he kind of skirts into the village. He doesn't deny that he can heal, but he doesn't like promote it. He doesn't have posters out. There's no WhatsApp number. There's no uh, Facebook thing, you know. He just kind of rolls in, but people hear that he's there. And so when they hear that he's there, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. See, motherhood drove her to God. It was a God that she didn't know, but she knew that her daughter was not okay. And this is the definition of intercessory. We talk about intercessory prayer. It's when you pray for others. She was displaying how to be an intercessor. Because she was taking what was afflicting her daughter and taking it on herself. Which is what you do, moms. You take the struggles of your children and you bear that burden. You also carry that burden. And she's taking that burden that she feels for her daughter. And she's running to the feet of Jesus, who she doesn't know. And she's dumping it out in him and saying, can you please help me? And then in the next verse, she goes on and the woman was a Gentile, a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nationality. But she kept pleading with him. She kept on and kept on pleading. Please drive the demon out of her daughter. He was saying to her, first, let the children of Israel be fed. Now, this is where maybe it gets um, a little bit like cryptic here, but it, it actually makes sense. It's not that complicated. So he says to her, first let the children of Israel be fed, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the pet dogs. Now what Jesus means by that is that he came for the Israelites, for the restoration of the Israelites and the Jews. I mean, he came for all of us, but the bulk of his ministry was there. But he hasn't forgotten about the Gentiles. That's why he's made this trip, is to show that. And so he's saying the miracles, the bread of life that he has, is first for the restoration of the Israelites. So that, that's what he's mentioning there. But then this term here where he says, For it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the pet dogs. Okay, dogs. A dog was a term that, uh, that the Jewish people would refer to Gentile women with. And it was unbelievably derogatory. We have a, a comparative term to it today. I was reading uh, a Bible commentary on this, and it had the word in there. And I was like, oh, it's crazy. There's a cuss word in the Bible commentary, you know. And I thought, well, if it's in the Bible, then I can say it on stage, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not going to. But th this is a horrible word. It's a bad, bad word. So what Jesus does is he takes that word and he softens it, and then he adds affection to it. So yes, he's just told this woman, hey, the bread of life isn't for you first. But then he adds this affection to a term. So he's taken what the Jewish people have used to shame and degrade. And he's added a love and an affection to it by this, this word pet, dogs instead. It's, it's, a, it's a term of endearment and affection. But she replies, yes, Lord, look how clever she is. But even the pet dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. 
See, what she didn't say here is, well, how dare you? you? You should fix my daughter now. You should save my daughter now. How dare you? How dare you call me that? She doesn't fly off the handle. We don't have like a, a, a Karen moment here where she goes crazy on him. Instead, she humbles herself. And she says, in a humble you know, way, because she's desperate for her daughter, she says, yeah, okay, I recognize it. I hear what you're saying, but... Don't dogs even get, if you're, if you're calling me like a family dog, like an affectionate term, don't they get crumbs that fall on the floor? And so because of her response, Jesus, he says to her, he says, because of this answer, reflecting your humility and your faith, go knowing that your request is granted. The demon has left your daughter permanently and returning to her home, she found the child lying on the couch, the demon having gone. The child was relaxed and resting on the couch. See, it was her faith, or it was her, her motherhood that drove her to Jesus, that drove her to God. Motherhood drove her to the presence of God, drove her to the feet of God. And when she came home, because of her faith, her child was relaxed and resting. You know, my hope for me today is that when I go home, the little gremlins that live in my house are relaxed and resting. Right? Sometimes we wonder, are they demon-possessed? You know, we walk around the room throwing water on them, you know, see if it burns or not. No, it doesn't. Our kids are great. They're amazing. But could you imagine the relief on her heart when she goes home to see this child that she's bared the burden for? But it's because she was driven to Jesus. And now imagine the faith that she has. See, there's nothing like motherhood that will drive your face to the floor. This is real. That will drive your face to the floor, your knees to your chest, and cause your soul to beg and plead with God because you need Him. Motherhood will do that unlike anything else. It will drive you to the Creator, even if you don't know Him. Whether you know Him or not, it will drive you to God. Now, once you've been driven there, that talks a lot about like the purpose for your suffering or the purpose for your pain is to drive you to God or drive you to Jesus. The rest of this, it continues on. Not only does God want to drive you to Him, but now God wants to use motherhood to reveal His character to you. So he's, God's saying, moms, I have a plan. I'm going to use your situation to bring you into my presence. Even if you don't love me or understand me or know how much I love or understand you. And then once I've got your attention... Once you're in my presence, I'm going to use your motherhood to reveal my character to you. I'm going to show you about myself. And I, I, I was having kind of a hard time finding a way to illustrate this or explain this to you. And I thought back to my wife. You know, I, I've heard my wife say, um, you know, she's told me, she said, I just feel like the worst came out of me today. You know, like the kids drove her to a place where she's, she said, like, I, I feel a little bit shameful that the worst came out of me today. And then sometimes, or more often than that, I'll get these pictures from her. And it'll be pictures of just elated joy. I know a lot of people follow her little whatever they are on Instagram or whatnot. And, it, and it's these reels, and, and that, that's not all that life is. Life is not this perfect joy with our kids, you know, all the time. But it's a, it's a good reminder that it does exist. And the strength that I see in my wife is, in spite of those moments where she's like, I feel like I'm just getting this thing wrong. Especially when she sees one of our children mimic the wrong that she realizes she's showing them. That's just heartbreaking. You know, I feel that too as a dad when... My, when, when the worst comes out of me, and at the end of the day, it's like, did I just wreck and destroy my kids? You know, I, I have a, a, Casey tells me I do a really good job of projecting my own insecurities on our children. You know, I don't know if any of you do that. Probably all of you do, all of you do that. And so at night, I've got this routine with, uh, with Benjamin, where uh, I, I read him a story, and we're laying in bed, and then I, I, I roll over and I, I look at him, and I tell him, you know, you're my favorite. So I have a favorite child, which you're not supposed to have. But, and it's, it's Wyatt, you know, our two-year-old. But I say to Benjamin, you're my favorite Benjamin. And he says, yes. And I say, yeah, you're my favorite Jam. You're my favorite Benjamin. 
And then that's when I project all my fears of my failures on him. And I say, hey, do you, do you know that I love you? Are you happy? Are you okay? Do you feel loved? Do you feel like, like, like you know, and, and then I listen for his answers. And sometimes he says things, uh, actually said it yesterday. He said, Dad, did I do good today? Because I asked him, do you know that I love you? And he said, he said, I do, but did I do good today? And I just was like, man. And I, I thought to myself, like, and I told him, like, Jam, it doesn't matter if you do good or not. I love you. I love you so much. The idea that something bad would come out of me that would make him question that. You know, moms, that, I know you struggle with this as well. That's, that's a horrible feeling. But what, what God's wanting to do is to use your motherhood to reveal what His character is. His character is not the same as your character. So I want you to think about the opposite of what we've talked about, those moments where you feel like you're just nailing it as a mom. Like you loved your kids and they feel loved. You know, those moments where, you know, I, I love asking like, why, why, do you know mommy loves you? And he says, yes. You know, like that moment of hearing that. The moment of hearing like, mommy, 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 as your kids, you know, see you for the first time, you know, in the morning. Whatever it is, that the good moment where you feel like this is motherhood and I'm just nailing it with my kids or I'm nailing it with, with whatever it is that I'm mothering over. That, how good that feels can never compare to how much Jesus loves or the character of God, the loving character of God. Because... See, what could be better than the moments where you feel like you get it right? Almost nothing. Almost nothing can be better. You could have the worst day in the world and go home and a child crawls up into your lap or one of your older kids does something right or does something well or, or tells you that, you that they love you and you just think, oh, man, all that that I invested in them, we're getting it right. That just feels so good. But the, the truth that God, God's character gets revealed through this. Because as we love our children, we get a glimpse of how much God loves us. And here's where this is in the Bible here. In Matthew 7, verse 9, it says, Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will instead give him a stone? That, that's crazy. No, no parent would do that. Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? No parent would do that. No parent would, would want to give their child something that would hurt them or cause detriment to them. And then Jesus goes on as he continues. He says, If you, moms and dads, evil, sinful by nature, as you are. So he's, 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 not, he's pointing out to you that you were born with a sinful nature. That's just what makes us human. So he says, If you who are not good all the time, who are not even capable of perfect love, if you're able to give good, advantageous gifts to your children, then how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, perfect as He is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking Him? See, what, what God is trying to do there is He's trying to show you that all the good that you feel in your motherhood just shows you how much more God's good is and can be. I feel like this is a hard one to get across to you guys. I tried, I waffled in the first service, like trying to just find ways on the fly to make this, uh, to communicate this across to you. And it's, it's really, it's difficult for me to say, however good you think you can love your kids, God can love you or God can love even more. Because it's, it's hard for us to feel that. You don't always feel that. We, we don't always feel, it's like, okay, great, I've come into God's presence, and now my motherhood has brought me there, and God's using my motherhood to show and reveal His character. But what if you don't feel like there is anything good in your motherhood or in you? What if there's not a good moment? What if there's not something that you can kind of build on and say, yeah, that, that was a good moment? Or, you know, yeah, my life is, is okay enough to say, Here's a good thing, and now God is exponentially more than that. I mean, the truth about what the Bible says is that God's love sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for you, so that whoever believes in Him shall have eternal life. That's God's love, and that's the greatest gift that could ever be given. But we're so disconnected from that. 
Because we've lost sight of God's character. God's drawn you to him through your motherhood. God's trying to reveal his character to you through your motherhood. But we've lost sight of the character of God. And that, if that's you, that's okay. Because lots of things can take your attention away from God. It could be uh, just life in general. It, it's easy for me to lose sight of the character of God. And, if the, and It's my job to try and keep sight of the character of God. And I lose it all the time. All the time I have to go and refind it again. It's not because God takes His love away from me. It's because I've let things persuade me and pull me away from that love. But the good news I have for you, as a mother or even as a dad or even as a single person, whoever you are, you can relearn God's character. It is relearnable. You are retrainable. It, you, you are able to heal. You're able to go on a journey. This journey that you can go on is one from hurt to hate and then hopefully to restoration. This is a, a, it, it's a journey where as you have God's character you know, revealed to you, where, where are you in this journey? Are you hurting? Has that hurt? Has the two opposing forces, the Jekyll and the Hyde, the I thought I had purpose and now I can't find my purpose, the I wanted this but I didn't sign up for this, the I, I wanted this as my identity but now I wish my identity was something else, those two opposing forces, has it created yet hurt in you yet? Has it created hate in you yet? Because undealt with hurt often turns to hate. And then from hate, it goes to a really deep and dark place. It goes to bitterness, which we're, we're going to talk about next week. And bitterness is the thing that can kill everything. It can kill everything good in your life. I don't want you to go from hurt to hate to bitter. I want you to go from hurt to hate to restoration. And what I mean by restoration is that your image of God's character is renewed. Now, I've, I want to be real with you and honest with you. As my wife said, I don't sugarcoat things, and I don't ever want to lie to you. And so I don't want to sit here and say, okay, moms, uh, on three, you're going to be healed and restored, and you're going to walk out of here, and you're never going to question God's love again. So one, two, three. Okay, is everybody better? Everybody's fine now. You're fine. You're not fine. That's not the way that it works. It could work that way if God had that, you know, in his plan for you. But oftentimes, that's not the way that it works. So how can it work? How can you begin to allow God's character to be renewed in you? How can you relearn God's character? And I, th I thought about this because I, I want to give you real practical things to do. And I thought about these little tiny micro moments. See, the power, there is power and magic in these micro moments. And so what I'm asking you to do is keep your eyes and ears open for these tiny little moments in your day, these tiny little moments of joy or happiness, this tiny little moment where in the middle of your kid screaming or crying that you see a smile. You know, the tiny moment in between constantly cleaning and wiping countertops down or cleaning up the floor or changing nappies. I want you to pay attention to the tiny little moment in between all of that where your child looks at you with love in their eyes. I want you to pay attention to the sunset or the sunrise. I want you to walk out and look at the mountain and think about the God that, create, that could create that mountain. Think about this moment here. You know, maybe the joys you're having your picture taken out there. But I want you to look for these tiny little micro moments. Maybe you could even try, this may be uncharacteristic of you, but play a worship song. Play it in your car. You know, we think that to have a close relationship with God, we've got to get up at four in the morning and we've got to pray for like, you know, three, four hours. And we've got to read our Bible. We've got to do all that stuff, but it doesn't work that way. Instead, just take the tiny little micro moments in your life where you could find evidence of God's love. Because if you can relearn God's character, relearning God's character is relearning how much God loves you. I'm going to give you a chance to do that this morning. Right now, for those of you that maybe identify as the Syrophoenician woman, this is the, the mom that didn't know God at all. But she allowed her motherhood to drive her to God. Today, you're going to get that opportunity. 
If you don't know God, but moms, you feel like your motherhood is driving you to the feet of Jesus, then this is your opportunity to go to the feet of Jesus. Or maybe if you are a mom that knows Jesus and you're just feeling tired or down, today you have a chance to go to Jesus and plead at his feet. So what we ask of you when we talk about giving your life to Jesus or salvation, this is essentially what that means. We're saying that at some point in all of our lives, we have to transfer our trust away from what we think we can control, which we hope we can control everything, and we have to put it into what Jesus did, which is out of our control. It's no longer about what I can do, but it's about what He has done. So whether you know Him or not, He has done something that is spectacular. He's drawn you to Him. He's trying to reveal His character. But He's saying, come and learn how much I love you. And so I want to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of salvation. We do this every Sunday because I hate the idea that we miss a Sunday and somebody that needed Jesus doesn't get that opportunity. And so we're going to put the prayer up on the screen and I'm going to pray this over you. And if you're like the Syrophoenician woman that doesn't know God and you want God in your life, you want Jesus in your life, this prayer is there to guide that for you. And then after I pray and after we do this, uh, we have prayer partners that will be down front. We've got a, a prayer table and a communion table in the back where you can get prayer and, and, uh, and, and take, even take communion with somebody back there. But let, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you want to pray this prayer and you want to read it and see it, then you can also lift your head and open your eyes because this is between you and God in your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I know my sin should separate me from you forever. I believe your son Jesus died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so I can live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my Savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.